this one's also on the buff. Um, this is sort of the backstory to the examples in the book. You know, a few of this stuff is going on. Um, now, the paramount situation.
Things split up, you have that going for you. Uh, I was thinking also just that, uh, you know, one of the things they said in the paper this morning is they're going to sell off some divisions, they're going to spin off some divisions, and they're obviously keeping some. So I don't know what that 11% really means. You know, there could be some high return on assets in that, you know, in the brand and apparel category. And or there could be, uh, when you're rationalizing, 11% is an average. So. Uh, there could be some 20% businesses in there and some 3% businesses in there. And now that you're looking at the whole thing, you know, someone smart, new management, they asked that the guy who was in there anyway may say, hey, look, I don't want to be in that business. We'll sell it off. We'll liquidate it. We'll just, you know, sell it and we end up in a high ROA. So, you know, that's that's first rush at it. She doesn't look that attractive, or at least the other one looks more attractive. And, you know, all I'd say is both, and there's opportunities in, in both those areas. So. Um, you know, to the question, is this stuff still going on? Is it easy? You know, it's a pretty big company. So, you know, we have to go back two days, let's say, and then we have, um, we have this thing where, um, actually, what is it, yesterday's paper? Um, yeah, two, right, so it happened two days ago, but it was written up in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. You have uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, board, board Aus Fiorina as CEO. And the big speculation is they're going to break up that merger. Uh, you know, it was a big dispute when this uh, compact HP came together, as you're familiar with. And, uh, you know, you had sort of a low return computer business. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it was David Packard. I think what was some, one, someone in it. Is it David Packard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What one of the directors, uh, you know, uh, from the original founder decided that, uh, you know, at the time of the merger was against Carly Fiorina's uh, purchase of Compaq. Said, listen, we got one good business and one not so good business. We have this printer business, which it's really not the printer business that's good. It's the supplying the ink to the printer business that's very good. But HP had a uh, you know, huge market share in that business. They had the quality name. They had the distribution. They had a lot of good things going on in that business. And that was a high return on capital business. And, uh, and the argument was, should Fiorina double down on the crummy business you know, and cut costs and you know, make that more efficient? Uh, that bet kind of failed. Um, and so the speculation now that the arena is gone is that they're going to undo that merger and split up the two businesses. So we have another potential spin off here where you have a very good business with high market share in the printer business. Everyone will see that. And then you have the computer business. I don't know how it all plays out, but you know, sort of it's an out of favor stock, really hasn't uh, appreciated much in a lot of years. And, so to partially answer the question, you know, is it easy to make money? Huge market cap company, a lot of disarray, uncertainty here. Uh, I mean, yeah. So, so for in this case, for example, what would your process do? Would you just wait as more information comes out and fall in the paper, or would you start looking trying to <coughs> do business a little more? 
Well, if I were your age, um, I would start now. Um, you know, I, I'm not as, uh, um, uh, well, I would just say I look for more low-hanging fruit now so that I'll look probably further along in the process, but there's a lot of money to be made now. In other words, this is still a big mess. Both of these things are a big mess. And what I would do, or what you should do, is to tear apart the company right now and get your first guess as to what the combined would be worth on a conservative basis. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. They, they haven't even put this on the table yet that they're going to spin this one off. So this is very early stage spin off. This one was just announced. This one, though, to give you an idea how long it takes, they said this is going to take a year and a half. And they said their cost, save, cost saves are going to come over five years in the Sara Lee. So that tells me these guys are really slow and out of it. That's what this tells me. But this is how long this is going. So the other thing that tells me is, hey, room for improvement. They're, they're firing He's the head guy. And, you know, they'll, you know, probably a good shot, they'll get someone better, considering how bad they are. And that, you know, brings up the other issue is, you know, Rich Pizzina made that chart uh, when he was in here last week. And we'll talk about him in a second. Um, you know, he had that graph, and whether you call it, uh, you know, this is average uh, ROE or average price to book or whatever, and you have sort of this kind of graph where something is very low ROE now, what happens? What do they usually, what happens? How does it, how does it get back here? And we're starting towards that. Well, things stink. Okay? Things stink there. What do you do? You change stuff. You fire the guy. You sell a division. You close a factory. You, uh, you know, cut costs. You do a lot of stuff, right? In other words, you just don't sit there and take it, generally. And so the natural uh, thing is to, to make changes. So, you know, sometimes when I own a company, I'm actually, uh, and I think it's really cheap, uh, and it's being run badly, I'll, I'll say, you know, I hope things get worse because I want these guys gone. And you know, if they're not getting rid of them now, you know, in three or six months, if things continue to deteriorate, they won't have any choice but to get rid of these guys. And as long as I've left myself enough margin of safety to suffer through that, that's one of the benefits of having a long-term time horizon. You know, if you say, if you're looking to make money, your money manager, you're looking to make money in the next six to twelve months, that's tough to live through. But if I'm getting a big discount and I'm looking up three years and saying, you know. Look, here's assets. They with this stuff going on without doing something for more than another six or 12 months. So there's an occasional time where I have a company, I'm rooting for things to get really bad, uh, even though I still own it, you know, because I've already put that into my stock price. Everyone knows it's really bad. And, and I just want some kind of change. I want some special situation to happen where they decide I'm getting rid of that division, I'm getting rid of that manager, I'm closing that, you know, I can't make it, you know, I can't manufacture in the US anymore, I'm going to outsource everything. Or whatever it might be, you know. You know, she was wrong, you know, and we've known that for three years, but you know, time's up now, you know. And uh, so, you know, these things are always percolating. There's always companies in trouble or things not going particularly well. Um, obviously, special, you know, special situations like mergers or something like that. There are, you know, the occasional guys who's good at empire building or you know making uh, strategic acquisitions and. You're in that mode, and it's from a position of strength. But a lot of these things come from a position of weakness. A lot of these uh, spin-offs. So um, anyway, so you know, I'm just trying to give you an idea of how I look at these things. You know, hey, the 20% plus business ROA business is interesting. Hey, you know, the 11% business. They have you know 15 brands. I don't know what's doing well and what's not. I mean, it's a big conglomerate. So that doesn't mean that much to me. That means there could be a huge disparity someplace, and I'm going to go look at this. And they're going to sell some, and they're going to spin some off. So I don't know what I'm going to even end up with. So the question is, when I start looking at these, um, if, if I looked at, uh, I think Sarah Lee was at 23. I don't know. If I figured the two pieces were worth 36, I'd start looking at them. So how do I figure that out? I'd look, I'm looking now. If I think they're worth maybe 27, I might like one or the other. I probably wouldn't play now, okay? Because that's not a big enough margin of safety for me. But so, you know, and all the numbers I'm talking about are obviously guesses and, you know, estimates. Um, 
when someone says, oh, this business is going to grow or something like that, I'm more skeptical of a claim like that rather than, let's say, a cost-cutting uh, story. On the other hand, when someone says, I'm going to cut these costs and that, I discount that hugely. I mean, that strategy was basically the Fiorina strategy at Hewitt Packard. It really wasn't the growth strategy. It was the, hey, we're going to combine these two and slash costs, and that's an easy one. Um, you know, common, they probably did slash costs, and the business was got worse, you know, more competitive anyway. I mean, it's a tough, tough business. So, um, you know, works both ways. Uh, you know, none of these, you know, I gave you the, the uh, spin-off calendar from January, so none of these are on it. Um, here's one that uh, was announced a few weeks ago you might have heard of, and this one is American Express. Okay? These are all large cap companies, and you think, you know, if you're an efficient market guy, you know, I'm going to look here, you know, 30 analysts are looking at this. This is what they do terribly. This is what, you know, when some extraordinary event takes place, to a company like this, they're used to following the company as they know it, and this is the type of thing that they're just not good at. They're not good at uh, change. Generally, they're not good at staying the same either, but um, they're particularly bad at, you know, they'll suspend the rating or they'll, um, you know, something really extraordinary event is taking place, they'll suspend a rating for a while, or they won't rate the thing, and um, or they won't analyze it anymore until the smoke is cleared, or whatever it might be. And, you know, so there's an opportunity for you. Here, once again, uh, this struck me. This was, you know, the first day it came out from the Dow Jones Newswire, uh, American Express, and a few things caught my eye with this. Uh, uh, he added that the removal of AEFA, which is uh, American Express Financial Advisors, uh, who knows what that business is? It's basically um, a financial advisory business for middle income. Americans, and it's you know, if you need to invest your retirement money, you go to an advisor and they say, I'll put your money in these funds. And you these know, the, funds meaning these American Express, yes, yeah, so although they say they don't do that, um, but they probably do. <laughs> they do that a lot, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and they're good funds. Um, he added that the removal of AEFA could allow American Express to hit the high end of its earnings target of 12 to 15 percent growth. We heard Rich Pazina last week saying, gee, you know, how many companies are going to grow at 12 to 15 percent? Now, I may, um, you know, th that particular division has been growing at 12 to 15 percent, um, you know, for a long time. And it's a particularly great business. Uh, you know, the travel business may go up and down with the economy, and so does the spending. But, you know, just to get 2, 3 percent off every sale of pretty much everything. Um, is pretty good, especially the, uh, I guess the economies of scale work pretty well and the marginal dollars start flowing in pretty fast once you're established. Uh, tough business to break into, a lot of good things about that business. Um, believe it or not, when I looked at this thing 10 years ago, when they were spinning off Lehman Brothers and, and um, those things, uh, the good business really was the uh, financial advisor business. That thing was growing like a juggernaut at 20% a year. So they kind of screwed that up. And now, you know, they're sort of the sort of the poor uh, relative of the, the main business. Um, and then the next line says, so it says 12 to 15% growth. Sounds interesting. Um, he said the company may also hit the high end of its revised return on equity target of 28 to 30%. So that's a pretty darn good business. Um, and then, uh, here, later on, I guess the fourth from bottom paragraph, it says, if you look at AEFAs, you know, the financial advisors return on equity at about 11%, that's not terrific as a standalone company. All right, well, you know, anyone see any opportunities here? Well, it's the same thing with Sarah Lee. This is this, this part of the company is sort of taking the blame for all the scrubs the company has made over about the last five years. And so, sort of once they get away from the rest of the American Express, there's a lot of opportunity for them to improve. Right, they're screwing something up because they should have a very good business. Yeah, yeah and I, I thought I remember also that reading that the managers of the AEFA were going to stay with that company, stay with that business. 
which uh, you know, made me think that they maybe they have the choice to stay American, especially going to that business, but they probably think it's not such a bad business. If they're, you know, that's possible, and I imagine that uh, you know they're pretty different businesses and it's to some degree. So I would, I would imagine that the management would stay in this particular case. It's also smaller, so it's probably right. Well, you know, it's out of favor. It hasn't done well. I think it should have done well, especially during this period. Um, it shouldn't be, as far as I can tell, a low return on equity business. You know, when I uh, when I was looking at the last one, you know, what struck me too was. Um, well, a number of things, but one, I always thought that was a pretty good business, and you know, I think some of the ways they screwed up was, uh, was you know, pushing people into the American Express products that weren't good and having those kind of conflicts. Um, you know, and I remember I met with this guy named Harvey Gollop, who I, I think that's his name. He was the chairman uh, of American Express uh, about ten years ago, and you know, was having a discussion with him. And we were discussing this business, and, and he was arguing basically market fit, you know, for a guy who's in financial planning, he was arguing market efficiency. Okay, and markets are efficient, and you know, with that, and, and you know, this was right after our discussion. But let me just tell you, this is right after discussion. I forgot the price, but let's say the price was at 40, and we went through all our metrics of why we thought the thing was worth 60 at the time, you know, conservatively, and he agreed with everything we said. Yet he was arguing market efficiency on the other side, you know, I mean, and I said, but look at your company, you're telling me, you know, this is not a fair price for your company here. I mean, you're either not telling me what you really think, which is always possible, or, you know, there's, there's a disconnect, you know, like in the, in the micro sense, you're saying that this is inefficiently priced. In the macro sense, though, you're saying stocks are efficiently priced and no one's better. And what does that lead to? That leads you to not caring or not even not feeling it's important. I know a lot of firms like this feel that listen, we're not going to beat the market. You know, this is the way the game plays. We're not going to beat the market. You know, it's all bull. And therefore, what would that lead you to do? It would lead you not to hire the best people. You know, because you, you think the people are fungible. You know, you all stink. All right, none, none of you are going to do well. So I might as well hire the cheap guy because you know I'm not I'm not going to pay for the best guy. What does the best guy mean? Now, they're all going to do the same. So I think you know that's a culture and an outlook, and I don't know if that led to hiring lousy uh, people to manage their funds. And I'm sure there's some good ones in there, just in case anyone knows anyone. <laughs> and I don't know. I haven't looked at each one individually, so I can't tell you. But I think that's a terrible attitude to have. I mean, you can have that opinion if you want, but I don't want you running a uh, financial management company. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, uh, but things were going very well at that time, and you know it, that was that turned into a allocation business, of, which is an important part how to allocate your resources. But I think that if you have low quality funds, that comes back to bite you in the end. And I think uh, I'd like to say that's what happened here. I don't know, but that's possible. And so, room for improvement is one way you look at that. Shouldn't be a low return. I mean, just off the top of my head, shouldn't be a low return on equity business. I have to look at that, what parts of the business. Also, there should be different parts of the business. So I want to look and see which parts are earning a lot of money and which aren't. So that's interesting there. Um, and you should be listening to me because your assignment for Wednesday is going to be go analyze this uh, merger, uh, American Express, this this, this spin-off, okay, and, and come back. And I'll, I'll give you the, the quick and dirty of what I read from one report, and then you come back and you know tell me where you think opportunities and potential value is. Um, then I also look just for the heck of it, you know, the return on equity target of 28 to 30 percent for uh, the travel business, you know, and the credit card business. Um, you know, I thought that was interesting because um, you know part of that business is running up a balance sheet, you know, lending money to people. Okay. And I'm not sure if they're getting a high return. You know, if they told me a return on assets was going to be that, I'd be really excited because, you know, you use a lot of, you pump up your assets pretty much if you're going to lend money. You know, you lend money to people at, I don't know what it is today, 8% and you're borrowing it, you know, 2 or 1 or whatever it might be. Um, you know, you get some free float in that business. You get a lot of good stuff. But let's just say your cost of capital is 2% and, you're, and people are paying you 8%. Uh, that's a pretty big, 
good business, but what you do is you borrow that money. So you balloon your balance sheet. So in other words, if people are borrowing 50 billion, then you borrow 50 billion at low rates. And so it looks like you have a huge asset <coughs> size. So you know, you know what's so you have a sort of a combination of business where you might have a business that has low return on assets but high return on equity because uh, that's the way banks work, for instance. Um, where in this particular um, and then uh, the other business where you just could have a high return on equity because you're just collecting those fees from you know sales and you know after you reach a certain critical mass, you're just taking in money on the margin, which is pretty good. So bottom line is even on return on equity, there's different I would like to see how what's the difference between how much is in the financing business? You know, what kind of returns on equity do they get there? Okay, could be high, it could be low, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, what they're getting in, in the TRS, you know, the travel related service business, including the credit card, because uh, they may be different. You know, one may be getting 15%, and the other may be getting 40 or 50% returns on equity, and that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, why is that interesting to me? Because I went and did a quick and dirty. Uh, on what the two divisions earn, you know, just reading one quick analyst report just to get a, a, a guess of what they're earning. And I think for uh, this coming year, um, this particular analyst said, gee, I think the uh, travel related service business, the good business, let's call it, uh, is going to earn 250 And the quote unquote bad business is going to earn 56 cents. So he gave a 16 multiple to the uh, bad business, so 56 cents times 16, whatever worked out to, let's say, $9. Stock's at 55, by the way. So he gave that, uh, <coughs> <coughs> so he said, I'll give that a value of $9, and then he just said, look, the good business is going to earn 250, I'm giving that a 20 multiple, that's 50, so I think the thing broke it up is worth around $59. Okay, and the stock's at 55. So in one sense, you can say uh, that's not great. And in answer to Adam's question, well, when, when would you look at this? In this particular case, I think now is the time to look at this. Number one, I see opportunities in both areas. Okay, uh, Believe it or not, and so this is a, let's just call this a PD of 20. And I don't know if it's good, but I'm just telling you, when I read the paper, what do I see? You know, give you an idea. I don't know if any of this comes out to play, and so, and I'm giving you sort of a context to do your work through Wednesday. Uh, but basically, it's just a 20 PE he's giving to this business, and so my opportunities here, where he's giving us a 16 PE, is, and it's earning 56 cents a share. My opportunity in this one is, I think they maybe they can earn a lot more than 56 cents on this business. So to stick a multiple on pressed earnings isn't necessarily what this thing could be worth. Yet, this isn't really the huge driver in value necessarily, because maybe, you know, $9 to 12 or 13 could be very good, you know, um, you know, 13.50 would be a 50% gain from here, that's good, but on a $55 stock, not the main driver, but <coughs> something I might, well, after I do a little work, be willing to own. In other words, I'm willing to own it by paying 55 for the whole thing, okay? So if I think $9 is probably conservative, then I'm probably uh, thinking that, you know, I really am paying $46 for here. So that here I pay nine, if I'm looking at buying a good business for 46, that's earning 250. Okay, so maybe it's down 18 times or whatever it is, okay? But, um, but the point is, I might be willing to hold this anyway, so I might as well buy it now, because in effect I'm buying this business, you know, maybe I get a free kicker of two, three, four dollars here, or more, I don't know. So I'm just telling you my thought process. I don't know if this is really how it's going to play out. There's you know a million shares or something like that. So I'm not that panicked that I have to figure this out tomorrow. Um, and I'm hoping not that many people think like I'm thinking, and also have you know 40 billion dollars to put to work in this thing. So I think I'll be all right. Um, so anyway, uh, so I think if I if I give a conservative value for this, all right, regardless, if I if I conclude that nine dollars is conservative. So what am I doing by paying uh, $55? Now I can actually buy the spin, I can buy the parent, you know, the nice, good business parent because, and I'm just assuming I'm buying it 46 and I can take that as a conservative guess. I don't have to wait till it actually happens because 
in effect, I'm buying two things I might want to own. So where I said the opportunity here is in the earnings side, okay? In this one, believe it or not, being a cheap value investor, I think the opportunity may be in the PE side, okay? Because now you're unleashing a great, you know, and I want to really look at that return on equity to see, you know, how high one business is versus the financing business, which might be a large part. You know, in the financing business, you could always, you know, sell that off or whatever and take, you know, get a high return on equity that way. I might want to keep that business, that's not it, but I just want to see what kind of business I own. And perhaps I own a 40 or 50% return on equity business, you know, if I strip out the financial part. I don't really know. And so, I don't know if 18's right. You know, uh, a number of years ago, and we'll probably analyze this later, is uh, one of the best positions I ever took was, uh, you know, because I had looked at Duff and Phelps, which we looked at in year two. Um, you know, I was sort of awake when um, Dun & Bradstreet was going to spin off Moody's. And uh, Moody's was a business very similar to Duff & Phelps, which got, you know, 100% plus returns on equity, didn't require any capital spending to grow. And so what we did in that one, and we'll see the analysis is, we said, well, gee, one of the better investments made over the years was uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, and so why don't we compare this, you know, adjust for interest rates, this, that, the other thing. Let's compare uh, when Buffett paid for Coca-Cola, and I was around at that time being old. Um, and uh, I remember thinking, you know, I, you know, gee, he's paying a lot for that. You know, I think at the time it was 14 times earnings or something like that. And I said, gee, he's paying a lot for that thing. And I wonder what he sees. You know. Oh, uh, anyway, uh, you know, that thing grew at huge rates of return over a long period of time after that. And so we would conclude that was really an excellent thing to do at that time, and even though it seemed like a relatively high multiple. So when we compared Moody's to Coca-Cola, there was no comparison. Moody's was actually a much, much better business. Because where Coke had to reinvest to get their growth, they had to reinvest 20% of their earnings back into the business. Uh, Moody's had to uh, reinvest zero. Okay, so you could get the same growth, let's say, and possibly even more growth, um, um, for no reinvestment. So actually, uh, Moody's dollars were actually worth more earnings than Coke dollars were, because Coke dollars to get their growth. You only, got 80, you only had 80 cents on the dollar left after you got your growth. With Moody's, you got to keep the full dollar. So anyway, that just gives you an idea of why I might pay a lot for a good business or a higher multiple than you might imagine, you know, something that gets a high return on capital. And so if this is truly uh, growing 12 to 15% a year, I'll take you in a second, then you know, I can project out three, four years, what, what will this thing be earning if I believe that story after I get done analyzing things. Um, you know, and, and put it, uh, a multiple on it, you know, in other words, you know, remember, uh, you know, if 10-year if bond yields are 4%, you know, and I could earn, uh, I could buy a business for uh, $100 that's earning $4, okay, then we're getting, we're both getting a 4% return, except this one may be growing. Now, what I said to you was, yeah, that's true, but that analysis kind of breaks down when you get to very low interest rates. And I told you I would never use less than 6% for this. So when I'm comparing uh, this, what I would say is, you know, I may take, you know, if you have a 20 PE, right, that would be the equivalent of $5 in earnings you're paying $100 for. So a 5% sort of current <coughs> yield, all right? And let's say I have to compete with a 6% uh, minimum. 10-year bond yield, okay? This can compete if I think it's going to grow a lot, okay? Um, and I might rather have that, depending on how solid I think the business is, how good the franchise is, how confident I am in my predictions. I may well want to have this. It's not to say I can't find other things that are cheaper than this, but that's my first analysis, is to compare it, would I rather own this or a, a bond, a 10-year bond? And in, and, uh, in Coke's case, I mean, I Coke. In uh, American Express case, I can already get this down to probably, I don't know, if that, you know, five and a half, six percent yield. And so I'm starting from there on something that's going to grow 12 to 15 percent. I want to see how much capital has to go into that business to get that growth. I want to see what kind of returns on capital are going into the business when I strip out the financial business. 
Okay. How did you get to the growth? 12, 12 to 15 percent? I don't know. I got it in the Wall Street Journal. I don't I'm not sure. I haven't done the work yet. I'd have to confirm. Okay. I'd have, it's, uh, no, American Express gave that guidance. Okay. He added that the removal of AEFA, and who is he? He is. I don't know, but it came from the company. Yeah, but it says the high end of its earnings target of 12 to 15 percent. So the company put out an earnings target of 12 to 15 percent, and so he's saying maybe you know at the high end I guess he's 15. I don't know if that's right or anything. That's so, but but I'm just telling you the formulation of a thesis is is what I'm saying from reading this one article. Okay, I mean, and then uh, getting one report just to see how the breakdown of the earnings are. I'm just telling you, okay, here's the start of my thesis. All right, now I got to see if any of this is right and how it works and how I pick it apart and how I'm not just taking the numbers they gave me and how I want to break down the numbers to see how they got there. You know, what's a good business, what's a bad business, or whatever. And, you know, it sounds like, gee, you know, that's a lot to figure out in about 40 seconds, okay? But, you know, if you do hundreds of these, okay, over a period of years, those are the first things you think. You don't even have to be smart. You just have to sort of say, well, it worked this way this time and then this time. And so what we're going to try to do in this class is really um, practice. Get as much experience as possible. That's why, you know, I, I want you reading the Value Investors Club site, you know. It's, it, it, there is nothing like actually losing money yourself to get really good practice, but um, by reading as much as possible, you know, the, that practice will be maybe less painful and, and you'll learn faster. I don't know, but uh, that's the idea anyway. Um, so your assignment for Wednesday would be to uh, come back to me. I gave you the general thesis. Come back to me with some of your answers on, you know, if any of this makes sense or what makes sense and what doesn't. <clears throat> Splitting up businesses, you know, opportunities. And so here, like I said, I think the opportunity is more likely... Uh, in the financial advisors in the uh, earnings. And I think here, you know, if, if you're going to be using 12 to 15% growth in earnings, or if that turns out to be true, it, uh, multiple expansion uh, could be the place. Because when I bought Moody's, it had a PE of 20, okay, which is not what I would normally do. But I thought the business was so good. And when I went through this, even this simple analysis of this 6% thing, and I, and I really ran through the numbers, I figured out, you know, I really should probably be paying 30 times earnings for this thing. And the earnings are growing. You know, so if those earnings are growing 15% a year, and you should get multiple expansion of 50%. Not that I would pay 30 times, hopefully I'll find something cheaper, but fair price was that. And there are a lot of people with billions of dollars who uh, will think that's a good deal, especially when their alternatives aren't, you know, that great. So. I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to run out and pay 30 times earnings for a lot of businesses, but I might even, in an extreme circumstances, and frankly, I've never found a better business than Moody's so far. Okay, I haven't. And so that would be the top of what I'd be looking at. But still, in that particular case, I looked at that. Now, American Express, I think, is potentially a really, really great business. I don't think it's Moody's, but I don't know yet. I don't know. I mean, I know it's not Moody's, but I, I don't know how good it is. I don't know if that 20... I don't know what that 28 to 30 percent means right now. I know it's very good. It's just a question of how good. I don't know if that's really 40 or 50 in the businesses I care about, you know, rather than the financing business where it's not. How do you uh, how do you think about the multiples in terms of whether it's worth 17 times or 21 times or? Pretty much like I discussed right here. Just in Six percent is a 16.66 PE. Let's say. Assuming no leverage, you know, I, I, I generally think in uh, pre-tax multiples <clears throat> because I'm looking at EBIT, but translated into a non-leveraged firm, everything else, you would say 6% uh, EPS, you know, 6% yield. So that would be the equivalent of earning you know, on a hundred dollar stock, six dollars a share, and you're paying 16.66. Yet is that six dollars growing? How confident I am it, that it's growing? Um, you know, how long do I think it's growing? How good is that franchise? How long lasting is it? And then I compare it to this. Then I compare it to my other alternatives. But the first thing I'll do is compare it to this to try to come up with what I think is a fair multiple. Now, the beautiful thing about the being a value investor combined with trying to value businesses is, A, most businesses, I can't figure that out. 
I just can't. So I, I'll skip those. So that's A number one. Number two, when I can't figure it out and think I have a pretty good view, I'm only going to do it when I have so much room. You know, you know, I think it's worth 10 bucks and I can buy it for five or six. Or it's going to be worth 10 bucks in two years and I can buy it for five or six now. Something like that. I think, and if so, if I'm wrong, so I kind of break even is the way I look at it. So I don't measure risk by volatility. I'll measure risk by, you know, how much money I'm going to lose. Okay, and how confident I am that I'm not going to lose money even if these 10 things go wrong or I'm wrong about these six things or whatever it might be. I'll measure it by, you know, am I going to lose money? And so, you know, uh, it's like flipping a coin saying, you know, five bucks if it's heads and I don't lose anything if it's tails. You know, you flip that coin a lot, right? <coughs> so that's what I'm trying to set up in, in <coughs> my investments. You mentioned uh, adjusting for interest rates when you're comparing Coke to Moody's to compare the valuations. Yeah. How, how did you go about that? Well, what I said was that we were going to discuss that in a later class. Oh, sorry. So, um, and it's <clears throat> not a science, um, even though it, you know, mathematically could be. I took broad brushstrokes to answer that question. Alex, it seems in a book that when you discuss a situation like this, that you pay attention to that book. Yeah, it's a good read. As a writer, I like the. <laughs> 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 Suggest you start looking at a company like this, but it seems like you really didn't make a decision until you actually set a proxy. Is that is that not true? Like sometimes you make a decision at this stage, or usually it almost always went to a proxy. You're, you're very helpful. All right, so let's go. <laughs> let's go to our uh, videotape here. The um, let's go to page one. You know, turn to flip over the first two pages, which uh, are the things that maybe you can pick some of your, uh, this is a spin-off calendar from January. Some of the spin-offs didn't have any of these three in it uh, when you're doing your paper. The next thing is uh, something we'll talk about. Um, uh, these are companies that are uh, own stock in other bits and pieces. In other words, these are uh, parent companies that own uh, stakes in other publicly traded equities that uh, we'll talk about next when we turn the page to see uh, the Sears example that we had in the book. And we'll just go over the, uh, the details of the, uh, of the timing uh, in answer to Adam's question. Uh, the first announcement of the Sears, you know, similar to what we've just read in the paper in the last three days, big, big companies, everyone's looking. Uh, this, this announcement came out in September of uh, 1992. Okay, and it says, basically, uh, this came out September 29th, and what he said is, what we're going to do is uh, sell, we, we own, Sears at that time had two big subsidiaries. Uh, one was uh, Dean Witter and uh, the Discover Card included in that division. And the other uh, big division they had was Allstate, in addition to the retailer that everyone knows about. So on September 29th, uh, they announced that we're going to sell 20% uh, stake in our uh, Dean Witter to the public. Why would they sell 20% rather than just spin it off? Get a valuation. Pardon me? Get a value. Get a value. Why do they care about evaluation? They're spinning it off. There's, uh, what, what they said they're going to do with Dean Witter is they're going to spin off, uh, they're, they're going to sell 20% of Dean Witter and then they spin off the other 80% of Dean Witter. All right? So they owned 100% of Dean Witter Discover. What they said they're going to do is they're going to sell 20% to the public and they're going to spin off the other 80% of the shares that they own. <coughs> okay, so one of the answers was, well, they want to establish a value for the spin off. But if you're spinning off the whole thing, what do you care? Your shareholders are getting it all. Is there another reason why you would sell 20% first? Tax related something? No, but it's tax related in this sense. You can't sell more than 20% and still have a tax free spin off. Okay, and collect. Uh, I think the general rule is that if you own 80% of something, you can tap their cash flow without, you know, uh, an extra tax step, okay? And so you would sell more than 20% if you were going to keep 80%. Um, but why would you sell 20%? Maybe if you want to buy something in the open market, like 
your uh, your shareholders. Well, you're pretty crafty, but no. Um, just to get the cash. There you go. You want you want money. You know, when you spin off something, usually managers. Um, the reason they keep buying stuff is because they want to expand their domain. The reason you're spinning off stuff generally is because it didn't work out or you're not getting the value in the stock market or something's not going right. Um, and so that's kind of a painful thing to do to get rid of assets that you are under control on. You don't stay chairman and CEO of both. You have to pick one and now your domain is considerably smaller. Um, so um, you might want to get rid of it but keep some of the cash. You know, value of it. So if you sell 20%, you get that cash. So rather than just giving it straight to the shareholders, instead of giving it to the shareholders, you take back 20% cash. So that's just one reason why you would do it, to get rid of it, but keep some of it, see, come, some of the value from it. Um, so they announced that they were going to do that. They were going to first sell 20% to the public in a public offering, and then, and then a few months later, they went spin off the other 80%. So you're going to get the whole value for that. And then also they announced that they're going to they're going to uh, sell 20% of uh, all state to the public, but they're going to keep the other 80%. Now, um, having been in the business for a while, uh, when they're doing this and they're selling 20% of Dean Witter, and then they're uh, going to spin off the other 80%, and then they announce what well, we'll <coughs> sell. Uh, sell 20% of Allstate insurance, and then they say, Sears said it will continue to own 80% or more of Allstate and has no intention of disposing of this interest. That means that they're going to dispose of that interest. <laughs> okay. um, because there's no other logic to that, to that move. I mean, once you sort of, um, you know, sort of can't be half pregnant here. They, they, they get. So, um, and that you can only get really from hanging out for a while and reading corporate speak. Okay. Uh, they, they are try what it says is we're going to try to hold on to this, but there's no way that's happening. So, okay. One question. Just what about some of the I don't know, internet spinoffs, like Barnes and Noble spinning off BarnesandNoble.com, and then eventually they, they did hang on to their stake and bring it back in. I mean, do you see that some companies <coughs> well, do that, uh, or, or are just I, trying to take advantage of? Know, right, that that activities. particular was an interesting situation where they they uh, BarnesandNoble.com, even though it wasn't making any money and losing money, uh, they could uh, do a public offering and sell uh, twenty percent right at some ridiculous internet price at the time. So they took advantage of that. Um, but I think because for strategic reasons, in other words, Sears is a department store. Uh, all states an insurance company. Uh, Dean Witter uh, Discover is a uh, brokerage firm, uh, uh, credit card company, and so there's no strategic reason to hold on to it. In that particular case, a lot of reasons. One, to take to take advantage of the internet bubble, and two, you can imagine that uh, there's a strategic reason for a, uh, a bricks and mortar bookseller to hold on to their internet uh, bookseller. So I think there, there was a strategic reason on both ends, why they sold off the piece and, and why they kept control of it at that time. So. Quick question. This may be asking you to read too much into this, but they have no problem admitting they're going to spin off Dean Witter. Why, or what's their incentive to say that we have no intention of ever selling? Oh, because they don't want to. They don't want to, but they're they probably will. going to have to. Yeah, I'm okay. just reading, yeah. Okay. You know, I suppose if they get the value out of the stock, it would be incredible pressure. You know, see, you know, in those days, uh, being from Sears was a euphemism for being a loser. You know, I mean, basically, I mean, really the worst of the worst. Um, and um, so, under pressure, they do this, and they're not going to be able to hang on to as, as much as they want to hold those assets. I did not think at that time. I, I assumed that I was eventually going to get that. I may have to wait around for a couple of years, but since my horizon is. Um, you know, three years, no problem. Now, I did not, to let you know, when this came out, I didn't do anything. Okay? This came out in September 92. So now, you move to April 93. Me still asleep the switch, even though I've been doing this for 10, 12 years already at this time. Still asleep the switch. And, uh... 
we see that uh, there's an article in Chicago sometimes, but every other paper, that uh, they're getting ready to, uh, oh, let's see. They're, I guess they did the public offering in Dean Witter. Uh, and now already, so I missed that again, and now they're getting ready to spin off the other 80%. Um, and what you get is, for every share of Sears you own, uh, if you're a shareholder of Sears, you'll get 24 shares of Dean Witter. So if Dean Witter is at uh, 35 uh, and you get 0. 0.4 shares, you're going to get a roughly uh, $14 for every share of Sears that you own. Since Sears at that time was at $53, uh, <coughs> you could quickly do the analysis is that you could either uh, short the Dean Witter that was out there and create the rest of whatever Sears was for $39. Um, or you could just wait for your distribution and sell it off when you're done and you know, take the risk where Dean Witter moves in the interim before you get it and get roughly $14. Not exactly $14, but so yes. You do that at the end. That sure. Just... Uh, if you own one share of Sears, Okay, uh, and Sears had, I think at the time, let's just call it 440 million sh shares outstanding, okay? Sears, let's just say, because I don't know the exact number, owned uh, 0 0.4, 176. So let's say they owned 176 million shares of Dean Witter, okay? They spun off. 20%, the 80% share of Dean Witter was 176 million shares of Dean Witter, okay? That's what Sears owns. So if they said, hey, we're going to spin off our shares of Dean Witter and give them to you, when they get done spinning them off, if, if, you, if you own one share of Sears, okay, that means that for every share of Sears you own 0.4 shares of Dean Witter. Okay, in other words, if if there are 440 million shares outstanding, if there are 440 million shares outstanding, and you're going to get 176 million, they're going to distribute 176 million shares of Dean Witter, that works out to each share of Sears is going to be getting, each owner of a share of Sears is going to get 0.4 shares of Dean Witter. <coughs> And then what you'll own, now Sears was trading at 53, 0.4 shares of Dean Witter is 0.4 times 35, or wherever it was, is $14. So that means that whatever's left in Sears, which is basically the retailer and the uh, insurance company, Allstate, you're paying $39 for effectively. Are we good? Yeah, when you were talking about it, you think it's short. Okay, well, you had D. Witters trading at 35, so what you could do, let's say they announce that this is taking place, I think this is going to, they're announcing this is going to take place in a few months, let's just say, okay, and this is April, and you say, you know what, you know, I want to own the rest of Sears and Allstate, but I really don't want to own Dean Witter at $35 a share. That seems pricey to me. So what I'm going to do, since I know in a couple months, I'll buy a share of Sears, and since I know in a couple months, I'm going to be getting 0.4 shares of Dean Witter from my Sears stake, right? It's like a dividend, right? Then if I short 0.4 shares for every share I own, I'll be effectively taking in $14. Now if it goes up, I will have been worse off for doing that. If it goes down, I will be better off. But my assumption is, either I don't have an opinion on Dean Witter, or it's overpriced, or whatever. Usually, it's I don't have an opinion on Dean Witter, and I do have an opinion on the remaining company, okay? Then, I'll do that. So, the point of this exercise, though, so that's April, they announce, you know, we're gonna be spinning off this uh, point, you're gonna get 0.4 shares. You know, you pretty much knew that already. But now they're announcing, you know, hey, it's in action. I know we said this in September, now it's April. We're, we're getting our act together and we're doing this thing. So the next page, uh, 
is when they fess up to the fact that uh, not only are they going to uh, page four, I guess this is, um, they've already made the decision to, uh, the headline is all state offering scheduled for early June, Goldman. All right. So Goldman Sachs is doing the offering for Allstate, and they're going to sell 78 million shares of Allstate. Okay? Uh, you know, I think I got my numbers wrong. But anyway, they're going to sell 78 million shares of Allstate. They tell you the range that they're expecting, not that that's guaranteed in any way, because this is just May. 24 to 27. Um, Upon completion of the offering, Sears will indirectly own about 82.1% of the outstanding common stock. Now, um, they also announce at this time that um, they're going to spin off the rest of Allstate also. Okay? So they fessed up to what they didn't want to do in September, and they're going to go do that. So now what happens in June, oh by the way, I still haven't bought the stock yet, okay, I haven't even looked at this situation, okay, because I'm a loser. Okay, so now, Allstate, just tells you, you don't have to be that good to make money, so here, we'll see on this example. Um, now Allstate is selling 78 and a half million shares, I mean, uh, Sears is selling 78 and a half million shares of Allstate to the public. And you see the per share price is $27 in this offering. And this is taking place towards the end of June, like June 20 something. Um, and that will leave them with uh, whatever the inverse is. I think it was about 343 million shares. And what was great about this for someone who's not a math wizard is um, that the stock in Allstate, the 82% of Allstate that Sears was going to keep, uh, was equal to the number of shares of Sears there were. So in other words, what you were left with once they did this offering was one, okay, one share of Allstate, okay. So you had, you still haven't got your Dean Witter yet. That's happening in July, okay. You're going to get 0.4 shares of Dean Witter and one share of Allstate. For each share of Sears. For each share of Sears. You're going to get distributed one share of Allstate and 0.4 shares of Dean Witter. I'm still not following this, though. So there it is. Directors of Sears, or it's just June 18th. Directors of Sears Roebuck Friday approved the spinoff of the company's 80% interest in Dean Witter. Discovered to Sears shareholders. Okay, so they're spinning off the other that 80%, which is equal to about one share for every share of Sears you own. So there's the announcement. June 18th. Completely missed this also. Luckily, on page 8, we have, uh, this is an interview with Michael Price and Barron's, you know, not exactly hidden, July 5th. I think my edge here was that, you know, it was probably a holiday weekend and no one was reading, I don't know. <laughs> so... I guess the only thing I can think of, because it was announced in September, now we're in July. Okay. And I see this interview with Michael Price, who I think is a smart guy, so, you know, I, when he's written up, I skim through Barron's, if I see somebody that I think is smart, I'll read about them. And so I'm reading this interview, and he says, it, you know, it's highlighted on the left, you know, with those two black lines, it says, Sears, on the other hand, has gone faster than expected, both in terms of its sale of Allstate and its spinoff of the rest of Dean Witter. Sears will be left with the retailer. And at $54, at $54 a share includes one share of Allstate, which is at 28, all right? Because uh, Goldman Sachs did the offering, stock's now selling at 28. So he's saying Sears is at $54. Now he's saying, gee, you, for, that, for that $54, that includes one share of Allstate, which is worth $28 a share, following that, right? It makes it pretty clear. So that leaves $26. Then you get 0.4 shares of Dean Witter, which is worth $15. So whatever Dean Witter's at that time, probably 37 or whatever the number has to be, it'd be $15. So 0.4 shares of Dean Witter, you're about to get um, 
So that adds up to $43. That leaves $10 or $11. But, he says, if you look at what's consisting of the $10 or $11, once you get rid of Allstate and Sears, I mean Allstate and Dean Witter, he says, gee, about two or three of that is Sears Mexico and Sears Canada. That leaves about $8. Coldwell Banker, which is a broker, you know, a real estate broker, Sears owned that also. That's worth two or three dollars. So that leaves about five dollars a share, or a market cap of a billion and a half on 27 billion in sales. Now, and then he says, the new management seems very focused. It's an almost debt-free retailer with huge real estate opportunities. Part of this whole analysis, when you subtract these values and everything else, what are you paying for the rest? You have to work out the debt, okay? In this particular case, there was no debt on the retailer. So truly, you had a, a market cap or an EV of a billion and a half, sales of 27 billion. It's about 6% on the dollar of sales. Okay. So this is when I finally wake up. There were, you know, 20 announcements, you know, big, this is not a hidden thing, Sears. It's been in the papers a lot. They're doing all kinds of offerings. Dean Witter's not unknown. Allstate's a very big name. I'm sleeping this whole time, okay? Now, and I, I do spin for a living. That's pretty sad, right? So, um, so nevertheless, I say, gee, that looks good. <laughs> so, and unbelievably, I guess I'm the only one who reads about my price in Barron's because what I was able to do after reading this was, if you turn to page uh, 10, I guess you're on that little circle, I took out an S&P care sheet. We used to use these before computers or the internet or whatever. And, uh, I think we actually had computers back then, but... Um, and I just did a quick and dirty, and I, if I look on page 11, I see that last year, uh, Jason Petty, and I categorized this as a crummy retailer, and I categorized Sears as kind of a crummy retailer. JC Penny had about $19 billion in sales. Uh, according to the front of this thing, uh, the stock was around 41. There were 235 uh, million shares and some preferred and all that stuff, but let's just call it 10 billion. It was actually higher. And so this is whatever it is, 55% of sales. Just as a quick and dirty. See what, you know, compare one crummy, forget about earnings and everything else. Just, I'm looking, you know, I don't want to work too hard, you know, because, you know, it's not fun. So, you know, Michael Price is saying 6% on sales. And then I look at JCPenney, you know, not even including their debt, okay, which is two and a half billion. I don't know if that's credit cards or what, so I don't, you know, let's just exclude that without their debt, okay? This is called the price sales. You know, if you added the debt in, obviously it's trading even a higher price than I'm saying percentage of sales, but I'm not sure if that's credit card. So um, Right here, I see right away 55% of sales. And here we have five and it's probably like, what does this work out to? 9.5 by 27. Anyone have that? Let's see, five and a half. Five and a half percent. Yeah, five and a half percent of sales. And you throw in the debt and whatever. So, all right, so five and a half percent of sales. So I'm saying, gee, this is priced 10 times. So I remember the 10 times, so that's why five and a half percent, right? This is trading on at least a price sales basis 10 times higher. They both stink. I mean, JCPenney is no great shape. Okay? Um, you know, you have to compare earnings. You have to do a lot of stuff other than this quick and dirty. But uh, even if uh, Sears wasn't earning as much as JCPenney, I don't remember the answer to that, you would say, gee, they're both sort of hitting the same markets, and these guys have this kind of valuation. Maybe it's overvalued, but 5.5% means maybe something could be fixed here. Or maybe this is just way too cheap, or I don't know. But it's one-tenth of the price of JCPenney on that metric. So a few weeks later, they spin off both these things. And... Um, I'm 
able, uh, what happens is I think they spin off the Dean Witter and then I short out the Allstate and create a spread. Uh, and then I get the Allstate back in a couple months or a month or two. So for five bucks, as Michael Price said, I was getting something that I think could be worth 50 bucks. Just quick and dirty. I think I probably did a little more work than that, but that's sort of how it came out. <coughs> and, uh, you know, in the next, I'd say it took two months, but this thing, that five dollars went to 30, two months after I missed everything and just read it, my price. And eventually it did go to 50. So, um, this was, you know, so I, I guess before I give you a break, how the heck did that happen? This thing's been out for months. This thing's been out for months, right? I missed it September, I missed it March, I missed it April, I missed the offering in June, I missed the Dean Witter offering, I missed the announcement of the spinoff. Michael Price lays the whole thing out for the entire world. I am then able over the next two weeks to buy whatever I want. Okay? Um, and I should go back and have that conversation with Har Harvey Gollop, right, about efficient markets. <laughs> but the question is, how is that even possible? How are we going to make money in American Express, Hewlett Packard, Sara Lee? You know, the front page of the Wall Street Journal for a long time. They're going to do these things now. Hewlett Packard's, uh, I mean, uh, Sara Lee's not happening for a year and a half. They claim. Hewlett Packard hasn't even been announced yet. It's going to happen, but they haven't announced it yet. And um, American Express is taking their sweet time too. Okay? And so there's plenty of time for everyone to find it. And, you know, this was front page news back when I found this thing at Sears. And this stuff keeps happening. So the question is how is that possible? How is that possible? That this is, you know, not, I mean, Michael Price laid it out. I mean, it's like Barron's to say, you know, it wasn't written in, you know, uh, Swahili news or something. I mean, it was like, uh, it was, you know, written in Barron's, which, you know, financial guys read, but sort of, you know, guys who manage money and stuff. Not to mention the Wall Street Journal and every other publication. So I'm just kind of curious, you know. They have to say that because it's back to and then Right, all right, that would be one answer. Yeah. And then I'm going to make a lot of money from one of those three. I'm not telling you which one. I, uh, when I wrote it, one of the questions was, you know, well, you wrote the book, you ruined it for everybody, you know, it stinks, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Um, uh, the first year after I wrote the book, you know, spinoffs did crummy. Now they've done incredibly well. Um, there was, uh, it's, just things don't change. I mean, this guy wrote this book in 1958. He didn't ruin it for anybody. I think I'm the only one who bought a copy. Uh, <laughs> it took me 40 years. But uh, this stuff's been around. And it was around then. There were plenty of guys looking at this stuff. And this was Sears. We're not talking about obscure spinoffs, OK? I would agree with your argument if we we're talking about obscure spinoffs, not on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, not huge market caps, especially for that time. This was a huge market very high profile businesses. Michael Price, pretty high profile guy at the time, I and mean, it wasn't really like the Stone Age, as much as you might think it was. Um, things haven't, you know, and I'm telling you that I'm not worried about making money doing this stuff. Um, so I just was curious what your explanation for why this, you know, we can do this stuff. I mean, it's sort of uh lengthy time process for a lot of investors. People lose, uh, lose focus on what actually is actually going on in the company. Now Michael Price, right, uh, Price wrote this up on July 5th. And so I had two weeks to buy this thing um, before it I mean, you probably, Actually, I mean, I think there's some merit to the argument that you probably got help by it being in the Barrens over July 4th. I didn't buy it yet. It, I, it hurt me. I mean, I wish he just called me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm making it sound too stupidly easy, right? Is it a hiding in plain sight sort 
sort of thing that everybody knows, America, you know, finan America Express Financial Advisors is a crappy business. Why would anyone want to own it? Don't bother. And so nobody bothers. Could be. I mean, that's part of it. I think it's messy. You know, an institution's not going to, you know, want to own this piece, that piece. You know, I, I like Dean Witter. I don't like this. It's, it, it's messy. But you okay. think, I mean, that plenty of hedge funds could go around to take that risk and create the spread shorting stock. Well, yeah, I had a short for a week or two. Yeah, but I... I, I, I mean, it's not that institutions don't want to own it, I wouldn't think. I mean, right now, there's plenty of institutions that... Okay, so you're would, saying... That would, at least, potentially. Okay, well, there were plenty of institutions back then, and there are plenty of institutions now, and I'm telling you, after the first year after I wrote the book, it's been also done great. I, you know, isn't it good though? <laughs> <laughs> How did the other two spun off companies fare? Because maybe it's just difficult to value the three together. Again. Well, I answer this a lot in the class. I don't know and I don't care. You know, I created this thing for five bucks and it went to 30 in two months, so that was good. Um, <laughs> But um, they both actually, uh, to my knowledge, didn't cave in in any way. There, were, there wasn't like some uh, Palm 3 comp thing that had a, a short window or something like that. This was really a, uh, oh, by the way, you know, I wrote the book. I did Palm 3 comp, you know, and I created, I, I did the same thing. I bought Palm and I shorted, uh, I'm sorry, I bought 3 comp and I shorted Palm. And I was able to own the rest of uh, 3Com for negative $23, which I thought was a good deal. <laughs> paid me $23 to take the rest. I thought that was really good. Um, so that wasn't that long ago. But uh, that was really, you know, inexplicable. Inexplicable. Um, well, I clearly can't explain it. Um, so anyway, bottom line is, this stuff happens, okay? This is a particularly blatant one, uh, but these are blatant ones too, and there's gonna be a lot of money to be made, and I, I tried to help you in the beginning, say, well, everyone's not gonna really be looking at it that way, you know, where's my opportunity here, where's my opportunity there? And if you own 30, 40, 50 stocks, you're not gonna spend a lot of time really analyzing the messy ones and, and this and that. There are plenty of hedge funds out there, but they're all subject to the same, you know, biases and, and you know, they do what their friend's doing or whatever it is. They don't, you know, it, it is somewhat hiding in plain sight. It is that it's complicated. It is that perhaps we have to think about it in a little different way. And we have to practice that. And I'm better than, at it than I was 20 years ago. And I've seen a lot of things and experience is good. But Michael Price, like, you know, laid it out for me. You know, I, I even missed it you know, or was too lazy to look at it or whatever it might be, and here, a very easy one. And despite what anyone tells you, um, and obviously I'm showing you one of the better ones, but this stuff's out there, and just, you know, last three days, tons of fodder for this kind of analysis, and there are different times to get in. There's plenty of time to get in. Uh, sometimes you should get in early because the split up is a good thing and you have to analyze that quickly. So I would look at this and say, you know what, what I really want to own, if you, you're kind of screwed. If you wanted to own, uh, I took it off the board, but if you want to own American Express Financial Advisors and it's the $9 piece of the $55 stock, you're kind of, you got to wait because you don't want to take on that big $46 thing that you can't hedge out in exchange to get the $9 thing you bless you that you think is cheap. But like I said, I might be interested in the main business. Don't know yet, you're gonna tell me on Wednesday. But I might be interested in the, in the main business. And if I think that $9 is pretty conservative for the other one, I may be able to play right now. Okay, I may be able to buy this thing right now at $55 because I'm not taking on that huge elephant with me. I'm actually buying a piece of something that may be cheap and I don't really think it's expensive. I don't know if that's the case, Steve. I uh, just wanted to uh, understand your, your trading strategy. You. Uh, you bought after Dean Witter was dispersed? I bought, I think, a week before a week it before. was dispersed. I shorted it out, but you didn't have to, so, you know, in this particular case, let me explain something. You shorted once it's out. No, I shorted it the week before it was spun off and covered my short within a week. <clears throat> However, you didn't have to do any of that fancy stuff because, number one, 
if you looked at Allstate, and you deem where you're getting in a week, Allstate you're getting in a month or two. Now Allstate was a very uh, stodgy insurance company, not trading at particularly high value. Okay, in other words, it was a very average to low price at that time. It was trading. It was a um, trading in line with all the other guys. Um, I didn't think it was expensive. There was really no reason to hedge it, other than this was so good. I wanted to buy so much that I didn't really want to take the Allstate risk with it. But just a regular shareholder could be like the American Express. And to me, it was like. Look, I'm willing to buy American Express now if I like uh, financial, if I like um, the the travel related service business because the good business uh, because that's a big chunk. And as long as I feel pretty good that that nine dollars is going to be worth eight or ten, then that's not going to be the driver of whether I want to own this. And I wouldn't even short any if I could short out the twenty percent that's trading. I wouldn't. So you borrowed one Oscar and point four of uh, Dean Witter. And you bought Sears. And then I got the point four Dean Witter back right. in one week. And then I got the Allstate back in two months. And actually, what I did was, so that we could buy a lot, um, which was something that was less uh, available then, I did a derivative trade where I just laid out the five bucks. And, you know, it was long and assumed that the two, so I just, and literally invested $5 in this. Thing. I guess that's where I was getting at, because, I mean, what, what was the rationale if, if one you were going to get in a week, the other one you are going to get in two months? Well, I, I only... buy the Sears. I just wanted to know why you... Why? Because um, I did not think if I was long Sears and short Allstate that I was really taking any risk, since I'm getting my Allstate shares. I'm taking the two months risk as it, you know, not even risk, but just two months till I got the shares to cover my short. Okay. So um, I wanted to buy a lot and I didn't have enough money. So I wanted to just lay out my five bucks rather than you know, 33 even though I didn't, you know, even though I thought there was 30, 40 bucks of room in this thing. So as an individual investor, you still could have, you know, taken huge advantage of this thing. You mentioned that you shot it, uh, the, the old thing and the, the thing with, thing with it before there. Uh, public offering. I mean, no, not before the public offering. Before they was the uh, eighty percent was spun off. After the okay. public offering. So you still can borrow the stocks. Yeah. yeah, there were hundreds and hundreds of millions of shares. Okay, okay. okay. so that was not tight. That was not tight. Uh, what percent of your portfolio are you in a position like this when you say, "Well, this is a big upside"? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about portfolio management. I'm on the. Uh, you only have a few positions, so obviously. Uh, yeah, I'm on great. the scale. I'm on the uh, extreme scale of, gee, I can make ten times my money. How much should I put in here? And it, you know, whatever model you throw that into, it's like a lot, right? <laughs> you, you want to put a big percentage of your portfolio in there. So I don't remember the specific amount, but it was, you know, huge. <laughs> anyway, I'll give you. Uh, come back in, you know, ten after. Okay, and I'll let you go.